The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in the hope that the creation will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. In those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution or famine, or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and that in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, thank you so much, Leone, for reading that. It's so encouraging to hear Scripture read out loud, isn't it? As we come and look at God's Word, let's pray now. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have not left us alone, but you have sent your Spirit to guide us into all truth. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us as we look at your truth in Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. I wonder if you are aware of the name Yusuf Netakani. 
Yusuf Natakani encountered Jesus at the age of 19, and he went on to become an ordained pastor and led a church in Iran. In 2010, at the age of 22, married with two, sorry, at the age of 32, married with two young children, he was arrested and sentenced to death for apostasy for converting to Christianity from Islam. During his trial, he refused to recant his belief despite facing a death sentence. He told the judge, I am resolute in my faith and in Christianity, and I have no wish to recant. Thankfully, after two years of sustained international pressure, the decision was reversed, and he was released from prison. The then UK Foreign Secretary, William Haig, paid tribute to his courage, and the Guardian newspaper described him as an inspiringly brave Christian. Do you know Pastor Natakani, like many Christians around the world today, are still facing persecution for their faith? You know, we're in a series uh, at the moment called Bounce, Building Resilience in a Fragile World. And through it, we're trying to learn to discover what it means to be able to continue through life without being crushed by the things of life. As I've said, resilience by definition can only be built when we come up against things that uh, force us to be resilient. So how can we endure the obstacles of life without them tearing us apart or us tearing others apart in the process? There are many things that happen to us uh, in our lives, over which we have many no, we have no influence at all. Either they will define us, or we will be defined by something greater. And last week we looked at how to build resilience uh, while uh, suffering from injustice. And through it we explored the understanding that God is just. While He does not create unjust circumstances, God can still work through them to His glory. And so we learned that to build resilience, we do this by knowing to whom we belong. We are God's children. We also live differently and react differently in the world to the circumstances in which we find ourselves. We choose to be a people who live freely and free, informed by grace and not by law. And we realize that Jesus also bears for us our injustices in his body upon the cross. Also, we settle in our minds and hearts, knowing at the end, God will bring about perfect justice to all injustices. And in the meantime, we do what we can in order to try and get a just outcome to our circumstances by persistently also praying to God and asking for justice. This week, I want to look at how do we build resilience in our lives when we're being faced with persecution because of our faith in Jesus Christ. What a popular topic, eh? My goodness. Now, we could talk about the persecuted church, and I'm sure that we've heard many talks about the persecuted church. And terrible as it is, we need to know how to face persecution personally. As with injustices, persecution is most acutely felt when it's experienced personally, or we know someone personally who has experienced persecution. Now, there are many types of persecution, and in particular, I want to look at the persecution because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Persecution, the Old English Dictionary definition says, it's the inflicting of death or torture or oppression or penalties for adherence to a particular religious belief or opinion. So religious persecution can also be seen through prejudice or exclusion, not being chosen for a job, and that's pretty hard to choose uh, and to prove, or uh, the forbidding of religious, wearing religious jewelry. And we've seen a number of court cases throughout the world about that. But we need to ask ourselves this question. Why does persecution happen? Well, there is a spiritual dynamic to our faith. Therefore, our faith is in direct spiritual confrontation with the principalities and powers of this dark age. We are a people who bear the name of Jesus. We are light in a dark world. Now, fallen human nature wants to reject those things 
that are not like them. Now this finds its root in the fear of being changed or challenged, but actually there is a greater spiritual reality. And therefore, persecution finds its root spiritually before it finds its root physically. But we understand, friends, that persecution is part of the package. I'm sorry, it just is. We're unused to it in the West, but friends, uh, it will come. We're in a world that is increasingly becoming hostile to the name of Jesus and the church that bears his name. And paradoxically, we see in the name of tolerance, the culture becoming less tolerant of the message of Jesus and the obedience that is required to follow him. Listen to what Jesus said to his disciples and therefore to us. It's in John. If the world hates you, bear in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Jesus goes on to say, Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done a work among them, among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. Friends, no one likes being hated. But persecution of the followers of Jesus Christ has happened throughout the ages, and there has never been a time in the history of the world where Christians have not been persecuted. The Bible is full of great characters who, because of their faith, were subjected to persecution and suffering. Look at the nation of Israel under the rule of Egypt. There were periods of exile throughout the Old Testament. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in a fire because of their faith. Daniel was put in a lion's den. Uh, Esther had to try and avoid a genocide of the entire Jewish nation because of what they believed. Christian persecution started at the cross of Jesus but escalates quickly through the early disciples and we see the stoning of the apostle Stephen uh, and Saul was there watching. We then see the same Saul, the persecutor, becoming Paul, the persecuted. Early in Roman times, uh, the persecution started under the emperor Nero and escalated under the emperor Domitian. And this scattered the church around the civilized world and consequently the gospel spread around the civilized world. And within 300 years, the civilized world, world was a majority Christian um, culture. Most of the early apostles were martyred for their faith in Jesus in various and unfortunately horrible ways. Under Nero's rule, the Apostle Peter was crucified upside down as he felt unworthy to die in the same manner as Jesus, his Lord and Savior. As I've said, there's been, never been a time where Christians have not been persecuted for their faith. In the 1980s, there was a Romanian pastor called Paul Negrut, and he was, I remember hearing a talk from him, he was a Baptist pastor in Oradia in, uh, in Romania under Ceausescu's um, regime and he was imprisoned for his faith and on reflecting, reflection of this uh, uh, in the past he said he told us that it was easier to be a Christian under the persecuted church than it is when it was free he said the church thrives under, under persecution because it knows who its saviour is and gains strength from him on a daily basis when Romania came out from underneath its dictatorship the church lost people and became less salty. Today, in the church in the Middle East, in India, in Nigeria, in Myanmar, Pakistan, and China, people are suffering physical, social, political, and legal persecution. I've given a link to an article uh, by the Barnabas Fund explaining eight kinds of pressure facing Christians who are being persecuted today. Have a read of it. It's very interesting. But friends, the interesting thing is that church thrives under persecution. The fastest growing church in the world is the church in China. 
And that is because it's been forced underground. They are desperate for prayer and desperate to encounter the presence of Jesus. So friends, uh, if we know that persecution may come, we need to prepare ourselves so that we will remain resilient in the face of the promised persecution. Do you know most of the New Testament was written during a time of persecution? And we're going to look at Romans chapter 8 and see what insight we can get. Now Paul was writing to the church in Rome. It was the political seat of power for the civilized world. And it had emperors. And emperors would set themselves up under great dictatorship rule. And they would demand that their citizens would worship them as a god. Now when a government or a country or even the denomination of a Christian church starts to legislate against some of the normal practices of the church and the operation of the Holy Spirit, a choice will have to be made by individuals. Either we become shaped by the legislation and adapt accordingly and become part of the culture and not distinct from the culture. Uh, 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 the saying is, if you stand for everything, you stand for nothing. Or you stand for the faith that will butt up against the culture and the law and will, by the outworking of the law, see the persecution that may very well come. So what does scripture tell us about how to build resilience in the face of persecution? Well, let's have a look at Romans chapter 8, shall we? Resilience, first of all, is built in persecution when we realize that there is a price to pay. Let's have a look at Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If we indeed share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Friends, we are heirs in his suffering as well as in his glory. If we are co-heirs with Christ, we must be prepared to share in those sufferings. Now the problem with suffering is it's not nice, and we will try to avoid it at all costs. However, it is of a different order to suffer for the things for which we believe. A friend of ours who's currently working in the Middle East amongst um, some refugees, said that when they're about to baptize someone who is converting to Christianity from Islam, they ask this question right before their baptism. Are you willing to suffer for Jesus Christ? Do you know, friends, I wonder if we really ought to take that question into our own Baptist liturgies, baptism liturgies, and see if we'd be prepared to answer that question ourselves. Would you be willing to suffer for Jesus Christ. You see, friends, not only do we suffer for Christ, but also, according to this passage, it says that we are co-heirs with Christ also to share in his glory through the suffering. We're not to take glory from Jesus, of course. So a better translation, instead of that we may share in his glory, a better rendering of the Greek would be this, that we might be glorified together with Christ. So we realize that there is a price to pay in following Jesus. Secondly, resilience is built in persecution when we realize that there is a promise to which we can cling. Romans 8.22 says this, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but the hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. Friends, we have hope. We have hope in Jesus Christ, the hope of the resurrection of the dead. We have a hope of eternal life. Our hope is therefore on what is unseen. Paul writes to the church in Corinth again in 2 Corinthians 4. He says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is, on not 
Fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Friends, there is a promise. We have an eternal hope in Jesus Christ. Through persecution, we keep our eyes fixed higher, longer, and further. And that keeps our heart true. Resilience is also built in persecution when we realize that there is a provision for us in it. Let's have a look at verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. You know, we have the assistance of the Holy Spirit in times of great duress and great trouble. We also know that there is a future provision for us in verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those that love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God will make all things good. Friends, there is a provision for us that will keep us resilient in the face of persecution. Thirdly, friends, we also know that resilience is built in persecution when we realize that there is a perfect petition being made. Let's read verse 34. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Friends, Jesus is praying for you when you are being persecuted. Look at what happened to Stephen. He saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father. What an amazing thing. In the midst of being persecuted for your faith, you can be assured of this. Jesus is praying for you. Hebrews 7.25 says this, that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. John Wimber, the uh, Christian uh, pastor who helped reawaken the charismatic movement in the church in the 1980s said this, the good news is that Jesus is praying for us. The bad news is that we're going to need it. We need Jesus' prayer at times of persecution, don't we? We need it so we may remain resolute in our belief and we remain strong in the battle. Fourthly, res uh, resilience uh, is built in persecution when we realize that there is a special presence with us. Let's read from Romans again, verse 35 and 36. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Friends, there are many testimonies at times of great trouble that there is a sweet presence of God that comes in the face of this trouble. I want to read a part of an interview uh, which is linked at the bottom of uh, this video. It's from two Iranian women, one called Maryam and the other one called Mazaye. And they came to know Jesus separately after years of questioning and searching. And when they met each other, they decided to go on a mission together, distributing Bibles illegally in Iran. The two of them were so effective that authorities began to take notice. Officials announced in Parliament that a big Christian group had started distributing Bibles. In reality, it was just the two girls with backpacks. Mariam and Marzier's efforts to evangelize region by region um, Iran were cut short one faithful day when they received a phone call from the police station. That led them to be interrogated. And after 14 days in a cold, damp detention center, the two of them were ultimately transported to Evan Prison, a prison where people are routinely tortured, abused, and violated. For Mariam and Marzier, this prison would become home for the next 259 days. In the midst of the brutal conditions and the constant threat of execution, both of them made their jail cell a mission field, continuing to share the good news of Jesus. 
Marzier reflects on the experience saying, everywhere can be a church, even the dark, brutal place like a prison. Against all odds, Evan Prison would become the only church many of these prisoners would ever know. How extraordinary. Mariam responded to a question, what keeps you going or what kept you going? And she said with deep conviction that without God's presence and power, both of them would not have been able to handle even one day in prison. Both Mariam and Marzier remarkably attributed every miracle, every prayer, and every moment where the gospel was shared to the God who sustained them, the God who turned Iran's darkest prison into a church. Friends, there are many testimonies of the grace of God that has poured out during the depths of persecution. Jesus is deeply aware and brings his presence. The prophet Jeremiah says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In the fires of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were put in a furnace and the rulers saw in that furnace one standing with them who was like a son of man. Jesus was standing and does stand in the middle of our persecution. Paul writes this in the book of 2 Corinthians, but we have this treasure, the treasure of the light of Jesus, in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We're persecuted and not abandoned. So friends, we also realize finally that resilience is built in persecution when we realize that there is a proper perspective. Read with me verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Jesus took our lives upon himself that we may take his, his life upon us. The victory of the cross and the resurrection means that his body and his life and this life, this body and this life is not where it ends. There is a perspective, an eternal perspective. I'm going to read, uh, just to close, uh, from the book of Hebrews, a great passage. And what more shall we say in Hebrews 10? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning, they were sawn in two, they were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. Friends, friends, friends. Persecution, unfortunately, is part of the package. And therefore, we must decide to become resilient ahead of time. Job had a great perspective in Job 19. He said this, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Friends like uh, Pastor Nadakani, are you willing to remain resolute in your faith? Not to recant, but to stand firmly in an orthodox faith in Christ. For he will be with you and he will strengthen you by his mighty right hand. Let's pray. Father, we bless you and thank you for your love for us. That despite the risk of trouble and persecution, yet you know, Lord, as you yourself were persecuted, that you can come and strengthen us. We pray, Lord, make us resilient ahead of time. 
that we might know your strength in the midst of any persecution to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, as usual, I want to offer prayer for you, personal prayer, in our prayer room and our coffee Zoom straight after the service. So please do come. So for some of you, you, you may just want to feel that you need to be strengthened in your faith. For others, you may have felt some kind of persecution. I want to pray for you. And I want you to encounter the presence of Jesus, even in the midst of the troubles that you are facing. So God bless you. We'll go on with the rest of the service. And I'll see you at Coffee Zoom. Bye.